Hi, this is Andrew, and this is Keynote, the daily now.tv chat show with some of the world's leading thinkers and writers. Hello, everybody. It's Saturday, July the 15th, 2023. Um, weekends and Saturdays seem to be fiction day on Keynote. Uh, earlier today, an interesting show with uh, a novelist, Amy Rowland. Uh, Amy has a new novel out, <coughs> excuse me, Inside the Wolf. It's a book about um, imposters and insiders, about rural America, about uh, a woman who is in New York who goes back to her origins in rural America. It's an insider, outsider kind of fiction. And she writes about um, writing as a vocation, something that doesn't embarrass her, something that she's proud of. Um, my guest today, in some ways, is rather like Roland. He also writes about insiders and outsiders. Um, he's a professional writer, although he's also a tech guy. Uh, Nishant Injam has a collection. I think it's the first book, The Best Possible Experience. Um, and there's stories about immigration, outsiders, insiders, India and America. And he's joining us from Colombo, Ohio. Ni uh, Nishant, uh, congratulations on the new collection. Thank, thank you, Andrew. Thank you for having me. Um, have I got that right, Nishant? Um, I, I, this is a collection of stories. So, of course, um, they're not all, all about the same theme. But if, if one was to find a theme, is it about India and America, the challenge of immigration, of leaving, of coming, of going back to India? Is that one way of uh, making sense of this collection? Definitely. I, I would agree with that, yeah. Um, immigration is definitely one of the main themes of the book. Although I would say um, the larger goal um, behind writing this book is to uh, capture a sense of yearning, yearning for um, home or, or even just the, the ability to feel things deeply. Um, that I think is uh, the, that's, I think that's what the book is about. Um, as I said, you, you're partly a professional writer. You got your MFA um, from the University of Michigan. You've won all sorts of awards. You're on tour right now, but you also work in technology. Um, you work for a company that's focusing on drive through technology. Uh, you're based in Chicago. How do you balance those two worlds? It must be quite a challenge. It, it is. And I have to say, I am not doing so well on that front. The only way I get around um, to doing the things I um, love doing, which is mainly writing, um, is by um, making sure I steal an hour or two after um, after my family falls asleep, um, after I'm done with all of my uh, day job related activities, which is tiring and it takes a toll on my, you know, my sleep and everything, but I'm hoping at some point I can transition into being just a writer. You say when your family goes to sleep, do you, I, I assume you have children and a yeah, wife? I have a, yeah, I have a, on, I have a two year old, almost two year old. He turns two next month. And so uh, tell me a little bit about your, um, your background, uh, um, Nishan. where were you born? When did you come to the United States? Um, I was born in uh, in a, in a small uh, town. Um, it's called. Uh, um, I was raised in Kamam. It, it, um, it's about four and a half hours from the city called Hyderabad in South India, and that's where I grew up. And uh, I studied in India, um, and and. I studied computer science in India, and at, at the time, all, the, all all my years in India, I had no intention of being a writer. Um, I occasionally read a book or two, but I was never much of a re reader or writer. And then I moved um, to get a master's um, in computer science um, um, 
I was, I think it was maybe like 22. Um, uh, I moved to Philly, Philly and then, um, and then ended up staying here. Yeah. Um, at some point in, uh, in my master's degree, I realized that computer science um, wasn't the right thing for me. And then I began sort of searching for other avenues um, to find meaning. And then I eventually came to writing um, while I was working this uh, tech job at the Chicago Tribune. Um, I used to um, really dislike my job and I was on this um, student i was on this um visa um that i was on this i was on an h1b visa and i wouldn't it wasn't so easy to switch um and even 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 if i did switch i would probably have found another job as a software engineer and not something that would have given me um meaning or satisfaction in that sense um and so somewhere around that point i think i was like 25 i took this creative writing class online um and um, I was taught by this teacher called Suzanne, a uh, writer called Suzanne Rebecca. She's a Story Prize finalist um, and a Stegner fellow. Uh, and and that was it. Like the after the first class, after written something for the class, I knew right away it was like this flash. You know, this was this flashbulb moment. I I knew this was what I should be doing with my life, and um, and then ever I've kept up with it ever since. It's a huge risk. Um... Uh, I, uh, you know, there are lots of stereotypes of young men like you and young women from India coming to America to go into tech. Um, you, you must have, um, you must have given this shift from tech to writing a great deal of thought. How did your family in India respond to it? Um, at, at first, I think um, they were um, very clear about um wanting me to do this um writing um while i still keep my job um but then uh, afterwards i think once they sort of realized how difficult it would be to do both um and um they heard more about mfas and all sorts of opportunities from me um i think um, my parents were like fully convinced and they they sort of trusted me the book has been very well received. Uh, Kirk has uh, called it um, meticulously crafted narratives. It sounds to me, Nishant, as if your life hasn't been a meticulously crafted narrative. Do you think in your craft you're, you're trying to create an alternative to the messiness of your life? And, and all our lives. I'm not suggesting your life is any messier than anyone else. I, I totally agree with that. Um, I, and, and that's part of the reason I even came to writing because I, I was desperately unhappy. I, I was in this really deep place of despair um, and writing was something I needed um, to create an alternative world where I could be more myself. I could be, um, I mean, I, I, I could, so I wrote, I wrote the book in a sense to keep my country and my family and, and the home I knew next to me. Um, I had no um, desire to publish a book and then like be a bestseller or something like that. I, I just wanted that sense of home and um, that's what um, pulled me into writing. And I, um, and over the years, um, that desire sort of slightly um, transformed into um, wanting to build a a castle with no walls, a, 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 a way to open up my home and, and share it with everybody. Yeah, I like the way you put that, a castle with no walls. It kind of reminds me, I'm not sure if you're familiar with the work of a, another Midwestern-based um, male immigrant short story writer, Kenan. Uh, Orhan, um, he was on the show earlier this year, I Am My Country, collection of short stories about the experience of being Turkish and coming to live in America. He talked to me about the surprising links between the Midwest and the Turkish metropolis of Istanbul. 
How have you found living in the Midwest, in Chicago? Does it remind you of India? Did it prepare you? Did India prepare you for a place like Chicago? I was just in Chicago. I was telling you before we went live on Thursday. I'm a, a huge fan also of India, although I haven't spent that much time there. But the vitality, the energy of the cities is astonishing. And I guess in a way, Chicago as an American city comes closest to replicating that vitality. Um, I would disagree a bit there. <laughs> oh, good. Because I think... I mean, Chicago, everything almost seems to shut down by 9 p.m. almost, 9, 10. Well, um, that beats San Francisco. Here, everything shuts down at about 8. Right. But I feel like New York is probably the only place that comes closest. To yeah. It. Yeah, in terms of, like, you know, that sense of chaos and busyness. Um, I don't know. If, I mean, certainly there are parts of Chicago that are... Um, that, like, say, for example, this little bit of um, strip called Devon, where there's there's a ton of um, immigrant families living and um, so many um, ethnic grocery stores and um, uh, South Asian restaurants. And um, that strip of Chicago um, definitely feels like it has it, it was that feels like it's some it was something that could have been like, you know, lifted from India and then painted in Chicago colors. <laughs> Is your, is your embrace of language and of literature and of short story writing, um, uh, Nishant, is it an attempt to kind of have your cake and eat it in terms of India, of not going back and yet also going back? I think um, if there was a choice, uh, if there's truly a choice um, at, at the start when I began writing um, I would have actually preferred going back to India. Um, it, I came here on this huge loan. Um, I had like a loan, fifteen percent interest rate. Um, that a was, loan in India from for, for, for my masters, yes. Um, and I, and I knew, and, and part of the reason why I even came to America was because I wanted to help my family, um, and. And so the moment I arrived in America, uh, the moment I walked through immigration, um, I knew I'd made the biggest mistake of my life. What year was that? That was 2011, September. Um, almost August, end of August, yeah. Why? Yeah. Uh, How did you know? Um, I, and people, I mean, I don't know, um, some people might take longer to feel that or, or, you know, people always craft narratives in their head. And even I mean, I'm not saying a mistake has to be always be seen as something that's to be regret, regretted. Um, I think sometimes mistakes can lead us to um, to even um, better places. Um, so having said that, I will still say that it was probably the biggest mistake in my life, because the moment I walked in, um, th went through immigration, I sort of realized um, as the immigration officer was um, speaking with me, asking me, to, asking for my documents and looking at uh, looking at my I-20, it's this um, document that I get from my school. And he was asking me um, like questions about where I was going to live and all of those things, sort of the things that I was struggling in a sense to comprehend him. Um, my, uh, and not only comp comprehend him on a on a on a verbal level but i think on an emotional level i think i understood that i would have i would never have the same level of emotional fluency that i have back in india um that i, I wouldn't have that here it would take me years and years and years and years before i could even begin to read people without having them having to say anything to me which seems which, like because, uh, that, that has the makings of a, of a short story, uh, Nishant. Uh, a young Indian man comes to America, goes through immigration. The, right. the immigration officer believes that he's desperate to come to America. But the truth is that the young Indian man doesn't want to come here and feels he's made already a mistake and he hasn't even entered the country. <laughs> right. Yeah. Uh, I suppose, yeah, that's... Where... Is it something... Uh, Begins. Is there something about America itself? Was it just the act of leaving? I mean, had you gone to France or China or, or mm -hmm. um, 
or, or uh, Thailand or, uh, or Ghana, do you think you would have had the same experience? I think so. I think, I think it's the act of leaving um, and the act of uh, the, the act of losing um, all of your sense of intuition that comes from years and years of exposure and living in a culture that's, that you're intimately familiar with. It's the certainty. Right. Exactly. You're you're never you're never going to be as certain. Um, you're always going to be second guessing yourself. That's which is a huge loss of confidence on one friend. And then um, you're always constantly learning um, things, uh, and you are uh, you're trying to find language for yourself. You're always also trying to explain yourself in a way. You're not you're not just allowed to be yourself in in the same way that. Um, people can sometimes take things for granted when they're living in their own country. But in a way that goes back to the conversation I had with, um, uh, with Amy Rowland earlier today, you know, she was a young woman. She left her small town in North Carolina. She taught at UC Berkeley in Princeton, worked for the New York times in New York. She has the same dilemmas and challenges and problems as you, but at the same time, she acquired a new language. You couldn't have become a writer had you stayed in India, could you? Um, I mean, the whole subject of your work is the experience of moving and of missing home. I, I mean, I, I'm not sure I quite agree, but at the same time, I would say, I mean, I, I don't I don't know if I would have become a writer if I was in India, right? I mean, there's so many good Indian writers um, who. Actually... Yeah, I, I'm not I'm not I'm I'm not saying that there aren't good Indian writers, but it just seems as if the foundation of your work is rooted in the experience of moving rather than okay. staying. Um, totally, the, the impulse the impulse to write came from having gone having been through the specific experience, um, but at the same time, I wouldn't quite say that. Um, that I wouldn't have become this person otherwise. Well, we never know. Never know. What, never. what about the, how is the uncertainty of this new world in America? How's that bound up with language? Does that help you with language? Does it challenge language? I, I talk quite a lot to Amy Rowland about discovering, finding the language of the outsider, of the imposter, of the insider. Did you? Have you struggled with the same thing? Yes, I did. Um, in, 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 in a way, I have to say this. Um, in, invisibility, in, in some ways, is the default condition of being a brown immigrant in this country. So as, as somebody who wouldn't have that language, it became, for me, um, an act of... Um, an act of almost like a revolutionary thing for me, an act of like, it's, it, 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 was, it was for me a, a way of fighting back and saying, well, I don't have the language. I, I am going to get the language so I can speak to you so that I can express myself. Because if I don't speak, then who am I really? Um, yeah, and, 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 and that's probably why I'm seeking um, language, which is probably why I'm trying to to write as beautifully as I can. Your background, as we, as we said earlier, is also in tech. Um, you have a background in, in programming. Now you manage programmers. Is there a language to tech? Uh, and, and how does it compare to the, the language of short stories, Nishan? The language it's of programming. Is it as elegant, as profound, or is it just dull? Uh, 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 algorithmic, algorithmically dull. Um, I would probably say it's close to the latter. Um, I mean, there's always beauty to be found in going after in in in, in the flow that sometimes you can find yourself when you're trying to um, solve a certain problem um, through code or you know. And there, I mean, I'm not saying it's all dull, but um, but for me, the world of tech. And the world of writing are two separate worlds, um, and I would rather belong in the world of writing than in the world of tech, um, even though I'm functional um, in, in in the tech world. It, I'm not how how it's... unusual are you? I mean, I don't like to make generalizations, but as I said earlier, 
you're you're part of a, a large generation of Indian tech uh, t technologists of one kind or another who come from India to America to right. to make your living. Um, have you found other many other Indian Indians like you who have shifted sharply from tech to literature or philosophy? I, I know I know of a couple of other people at least, yeah, who have had similar journeys in in a way, yeah. Not not many uh, many I mean I think many Indian immigrants tend to prefer um, to stick with technology or whatever career they've chosen, and um, and typically it's it's children of immigrants who usually write about them and not immigrants themselves. Um, and I think there's very few of us who are um, writing are telling us the, the stories the, our stories ourselves like you know as opposed to others telling these stories about us nishant is the traditional narrative shifting i mean in the normal way of thinking of this is india is is a developing country full of uh, people much poverty coming to america the most advanced the most dynamic and sophisticated of uh capitalist industrial countries but is something changing today? India is an incredibly dynamic place, full of innovation, lots of tech. America is increasingly in crisis of politics, of culture, of division, of economics. Do you feel that in an odd way, the traditional narrative is being turned on its head and maybe in 50 years, uh, young Americans will end up in India and, and face the dilemma you're having or you had in, as, as an immigrant? Um, I don't quite see that at the moment because I think India is going through its own crisis. It's just it's just been so many um, series of problems, and in, in India has been facing as well. Um, I think as a democracy, um, India India's systems are are collapsing much faster than America's. Um, it's I wouldn't. I mean, there's a lot of innovation coming for sure um, in on technology front. Um, and, and also, um, on just on a, on, on just, I mean, just also because, you know, India is one of the largest, uh, populated countries. And so when I look at all of the middle class, middle class population or the lower middle class population, um, the families that I know back home, I see that ev almost every one of them has this desire to move abroad. Um, nobody really wants to live in India anymore because uh, everybody has this innate understanding that the systems are broken and that it would be so much easier to live abroad. Um, so all of that doesn't seem to me um, like a sign that the country is doing fabulously well. In fact, it's the opposite. I think um, there's a lot that needs to be fixed in India, um, even more so than in America. We've done a number of shows actually on contemporary India, one with the writer Mansi Choksi. I'm not sure if you're familiar with yeah. her. She has a book, um, The Newlyweds Rearranging Marriage in Modern India, a book about female emancipation. Um, your book in, a, in, in part is uh, a collection of, of feminist horror stories, as the New York Times explains. Um, is it rather different for young men and young women in, in India? And, 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 and what's your, what's your shall, you, shall we say, your calling as a writer, not just about men, but, 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 but women and, and sexuality and gender in, in India today? Um, I, I think my calling as a writer, if, which is a, really a broad, way to speak about it um is that is to rebel against um the idea of progress of um progress in terms of like you know um this progress in terms of fixed entities progress in terms of feelings progress in terms of desires like for instance um we've there's this idea that is that's prevalent all around the world in terms of like you know um like it's a it's a common feature of 
late stage capitalism um, that that desires are always going to be misplaced. Desires are always going to be um, something that the systems like to um, have a hand on. So you can you you always want the system always wants things so that um, if you like X, Y, and Z, then here's um, here's something else that you would want. Like if you want a, if you want a donut, here's here's a here's a drink that you you might want to um, take with you. So the system that's that's what it wants. It wants us to make us all into one dimensional creatures. Um, Marcuse talked about this um, way back in the seventies, but it still applies today. Um, I think what I, what I mean by all of that is uh, my uh, my entire sort of goal as a writer is to give um, depth to our feelings, to give this sense of yearning, this sense of complexity um, to uh, to the to the lives of characters, to the lives of people, and and, and to and to um, present uh, to present to to arm people in a way uh, with a level of complexity, with a level of depth um, that will um, make it easier for us to not be as easily um, boxed into uh, one-dimensional creatures. It's funny, Anishant, um, I'm interesting that you've taken enormous risks in your own life um, in shifting from tech to creative writing. Clearly, your family went through it with it in the beginning. It brings its own challenges, particularly in economic terms. Um, the, the response to your book, um, uh, as I said, uh, Publisher Weekly gave it a star, loved it. Um, you're considered one of the, the new talents around. But if there was one criticism on the, in Kirkus, they suggest that um, the collection takes little risk. So they acknowledge your command of the short form. Is there some truth to that? How do you take risks? As a short story writer, is it taking risks right. in in form or in content? You're you're on tour at the moment. Yes. In a way, I'm guessing when you go to these events, these short story events and mm -hmm. literary events, you're in a sense preaching already to the converted. Um, right. Is there some truth to the, the the Kirk? I wouldn't even say it's a criticism; it's an observation. I. But I would actually call it a criticism, and a criticism that comes from a reverence to a, an outdated form. <laughs> and I think I've I've, uh, I've talked about this in another interview on LitHub, um, but I'm gonna repeat it here. But I, I think um, what um, that reviewer means is that all of my stories seem situated. Um, they do not seem situated to provoke or offer critical commentary, I think, what, um, which is probably what they're expecting. Um, th my stories are situated to provoke, um, not to provoke, but, but, to, um, but to produce emotion. My stories are meant to, uh, meant for, um, this deep communion. I'm I'm writing those stories to exist in communion with you. I'm not writing to 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 make a point um, that can be easily dismissed afterwards. I don't I don't believe in um, at, at least that's not my it's not my aesthetic. I don't want to write. Um, I don't want to create art that can be um, sort of boiled down to one point uh, that can be. Uh, that can be used to uh, to to produce critical commentary. I, I think that's a more um, that I think that's um, that's a form of thinking that uh, divides us rather than unites us. Well, though you mentioned uh, Herbert Marcuse earlier, I don't think he would agree with that. Um, I think he would because. Um, because if you look at a, if you look at a, the form of a short story as it exists, right, as it is being practiced um, 
right now. Um, the only time emotions are admitted into the story is at the end of the story. So throughout the story, the, the entire form is sort of this tightly held thing, like there's pressure being put around this object. And then there's a tiny bit of a gap at the end, which is when the emotion is, sub is generated. Um, the contemporary, um, there's many writers, um, great writers, um, like Ben Marcus, who sort of define um, the short story as this, um, as a form in which um, when you, it, it, they compare it to a pinprick. Like if you, you, you feel a pinprick at the end, that leaves you, um, that leaves you with this uh, deep guttural sigh. Um, and I, to me, that feels so much sanitized. Um, to me, it does it feels also very masculine in terms of like pleasure and, and how, you know, um, the pleasure that a man gets at the end, and, and that's the real pleasure and not the other pleasure that's the, throughout the throughout the the act of intercourse, and it in in, in other ways also, um, if a release of an emotion, if it's if that is to be only if emotions are to be only admitted at the end or permitted only at a certain schedule, um, that actually is deeply indicative of the systems that are um, putting us in 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 certain places and saying, okay, you can't, those things are like saying, you know, you, emotions are off the table. We want you to be logical, practical, functional. And, um, and, and so any, any time you deviate from that sort of thinking, um, that is, you're, you're immediately an entity that's very subversive. And this is exactly the same reason, um, I think memories are so that which is which is, I mean, which is also why Marcuse says this, that this society really fears the subversive nature of memories. That's, that's Marcuse. <laughs> he said that, not me. So, so any, any, any time we have, um, and uh, any, 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 any art making, um, art making process that excludes or minimizes uh, the, the generation of deep feelings for me is um, is that's 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 a that's not a uh, that's not a free form. I think that's a form that's still tainted and in some ways with uh, um, with with capitalistic ideology. Uh, Nisha and um, I'm guessing this is very much in keeping with your uh, reaction against technology. Um, I wonder what you think of the new wave of artificial intelligence, of generative AI, of uh, chat GPT. We've done a number of shows on the potential, the possibility of AI to help writers. Could you ever imagine having an AI assistant, for example, to help you, in, and I'm quoting you here, in your subversive nature of memories or do you think that these new ais are are a threat to our humanity i'm guessing that marcuse would believe that if he was around today um they, they are a threat in the sense that um they will make certain jobs redundant um they are a threat in the sense that um as we tend to rely on them as the entire system i mean it's just the next stage in 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 this onslaught of having us uh, be controlled. Um, I mean, this is, it's a newer form of control, right? Um, some desires are granted. Some um, you can you can sort of um, transcend um, some transcend class to the degree that um, your needs and in the meeting of your needs um, are sanctioned by the system, so that ultimately you're still um, on the leash. So, so, and in this AI, new forms of AI, ChatGPT or whatever, they are all, um, I think, part of the same um, spectrum for me. They are, they're all, they're, they're all part of the same tool set. Yeah, maybe I'll entitle um, this uh, this conversation Nishanta, the unleashing of Nishanti Jam. Uh, finally, uh, are there short story writers who 
most inspired you you're trying to emulate i mean the one that comes to mind i'm no great expert i have to admit in the genre is Chekhov in in terms of the the, the craft of your work are you trying to emulate other writers and and do you see yourself moving on to longer books perhaps a novel or do you see always working within the short story genre no i i think i'm gonna work on novels um more more focused towards novels from now i think um the short story as a form um wasn't what i was originally drawn to i initially wrote um because that was the length of the question i was posing um i wasn't um i wasn't interested in writing a short story just for the sake of writing a short story i was writing these stories because i wanted i wanted a place i wanted i wanted a vessel to hold my feelings and 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 these vessels are the stories i wrote so i i think in as i go on with writing i think um i will eventually at some point write more stories but i but I, but at this point i think um i have a couple of uh, really long questions sort of raging in my head things that would require me to go on for pages and pages so I would probably say novels. <laughs> <laughs>